you're listening to the Prevention is the New Cure podcast, a special podcast on all things health and NHS with a political twist from myself, Steve Bryan. I am the chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee in the House of Commons, and I represent Winchester as its MP. And hi, I'm Helen Stokes Lampard. I'm a frontline general practitioner in the Midlands, I'm chair of the National Academy for Social Prescribing, and I've had lots of other medical leadership roles over the years. And it's great to be here, Steve. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Yeah, we're, believe it or not, on episode 15. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? It's incredible. You know, it's so I know podcasts are all the thing at the moment, but you know, and we can't say we were the first. Um, <laughs> but we we've been doing it for quite a while now, actually, in the podcast world. And I was on um I was on Radio 4 last weekend talking about how to get elected as a select committee chair because there's a few select committee chair elections going on at the moment, defense and business committee and what have you. And I was on with Mary Cray, who used to chair the Environmental Audit Committee, and she was reminding us that she did the first uh podcast podcast by a select committee chair uh, one of the first parliamentary podcasts called emergency on planet earth about all things the environment which is quite topical as we record this on <laughs> wednesday the 20th of september anyway and so we were talking all about that i think that's still available on on bbc sound so Fantastic. last time uh, on on a podcast we were on episode 14 we were talking about martha's rule weren't we martha's law yes we were and i think there have been developments in the last couple of weeks haven't there steve yeah, so we were talking about it, which, you know, um, Merope, who's her, her mum, and she lost her daughter, tragically, Martha, um, after a, an, a cycling accident when they were on holiday abroad. And and long story short, they are now campaigning to introduce a, a right to, sec- to a second opinion. And, and it is, and it is, and I say this, is because her mum contacted me on Twitter subsequent to our last episode, actually, and said, you know, thanks for covering it. It is more complicated than, than, than it's being reported, because everything always is, of course. Of course. Um, but we talked about it in, in quite a lot of detail on episode 14. So if you want to go back and hear more about that. But basically, since we last spoke, um, Merope has met where her mum has met with Steve Barclay, the Secretary of State, and he has asked the NHS to find a way to introduce Martha's rule for hospital patients as soon as possible. Uh, NHS England are beginning work on it. That feels like a really constructive step forward. And yes, inevitably, these things are far more complicated than they get reported because actually the nuances and the legalities are difficult to work through. But I'm glad that some good minds are getting to grips with it. That's excellent. Should we do what's new with you? Oh, yeah, we, we well. <laughs> <laughs> What's new with you, Helen? <laughs> so much is new with me, Steve. Um, I guess the, the big thing for me in the last couple of weeks is that I've been confirmed as a member of the new expert advisory panel to the hilariously named Frontier AI Task Force. Um, it's a bit grandiose, but it's effectively the expert panel are a bunch of people who are outside this huge, remarkable task force that's being commissioned looking at AI. Um. And the idea with us is that we'll provide a bit of oversight, challenge and a sense check to the remarkable work this task force is going to achieve. But the whole point is, I think, getting the, this this nation um, leading the world in terms of putting the guardrails around AI and what it all means. So How it's going to be interesting. Fun. Well, seeing as you're well, so well known for your technical expertise. <laughs> bit harsh, Steve. Bit harsh. <laughs> hey, I got the microphone working. What more do you want? No, no, I think I think that's an excellent appointment because you need people there who've got leadership skills and people who've got obviously clinical skills and you've got both of those in in buckets. So well done. Really pleased you're really pleased you're doing that. Look forward to hearing more about it as it develops. Yeah, I think it would be a good topic for us to pick up on a future podcast, actually, because I think the impact of AI in healthcare, and there's already a huge amount of use going sort of under the radar at the moment uh, without guardrails. And I think there's a good point here for us about prevention and uh, legislation, regulation, and some guidance for the big tech developers is really important. So anyway, but that's one for us to get back to another time. How about you? What have you been up to? Well, I've actually been walking. That's good. I know, I mean, I know, not not just literally walking, but um, a friend of mine uh, throughout September is walking the Camino Trail. So Ooh. you go through northern Spain and you end up in Santiago. And there's a there's a cathedral service every day uh, in in Santiago where basically pilgrims go and receive a blessing at the end of the pilgrim trail that is called the Camino. And there's also a French Camino and there's actually a um, Camino Anglais uh, here in England. Anyway, and I went out for a long weekend to join him for a bit of uh, three, four days walking. And do you know what? It was absolute medicine for the soul. It was good oh. for it was good for mental health. 
It was, in, I hope, good for physical health. I mean, we did about 20 Ks a day, which, I, which nice. maybe doesn't, doesn't sound like a lot. And if you have your head down, you're just walking along a, a flat road. It's not that much. But I can tell you on the terrain that is um, a coastal, effectively a coastal pilgrim path in northern Spain, it is brutal. And it was a lot mm. of very steep descents, and which were kind of, I can't work out whether I enjoyed the descent or the ascent more. Um, the descent was quite hard on the knees. But I mean, because it was hot and you're mm. carrying your, your bag on your, your Bergen on your back. Um, you know, we were literally running uh, well, by the time we sweat. That was not in, not literally by the time we got to the top of the hills each time. So it mm. was great. It was really great for soul. And um, yeah, sleeping in sleeping in guest houses that are sort of set up for the pilgrims. Yeah. I'm so pleased to see you and uh, just a really um, amazing thing to be able to do. So I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm so glad you did that, that you're able to join and support your friend. But, you know, you know, my passion for social prescribing, all this stuff that is good for our health and well-being outside what medicine and the health system can do. And I'm very struck by the place of spirituality, our soul, as well as the sort of psychological and stuff that lifts our well-being. And I think we neglect to talk about this stuff often, and it has a huge place in helping us be the best version of ourselves. So I'm really glad you did it. Thanks, yeah. Do you know what I love the most about it was just the sheer simplicity of our life. Mm. So basically, you know, we would get up. And then really all we had to decide is where was the next yellow arrow? Because you basically <laughs> follow these, you follow these yellow arrows, which are everywhere. I just did paint on you know corner of somebody's garden wall or on a tree or a post sometimes they're quite small it is a case of hunt the arrow or you see these little yellow shells which uh, basically indicate where the Camino trail goes next and you, so basically we had to decide is you know where we found the next arrow and then where we were going to sleep that night and where we were going to have something to eat and a beer that was it really that was that was the simplicity of it so when I got back into Gatwick and got the Gatwick Express into Victoria into the Malay of West central london i was just like oh my oh my the only thing that wasn't good was my spanish helen i mean honestly embarrassing all i can say is google translate which just reads out what you say into it um luckily they seem to expect fools like me Oh, the Spanish is so gracious about our appalling attempts at their language. And I think um, we have so much to learn from our colleagues around the globe in terms of language. So beautifully gracious, yes. Um, anyway, a couple of things to talk about uh, before we have a guest. Yeah. We have a guest on this week. I talk about guests. So when we started this podcast, right, um, mm. 15 episodes ago, mm. we talked about strikes, industrial we action, did. the NHS. Mm. Here we are, end September. We're talking about strikes. And as we record this, we are in the first ever combined junior doctors consultant strike across the NHS in England. I I really hoped and prayed we wouldn't get this far. I wouldn't go this far. I am so saddened that we've got to this point. And I mean, that's not about casting aspersions on any side in this one. But quite frankly, this is 2023, Steve. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the, these walkouts so far, we reckon, have led to about 900,000 appointments being cancelled. So, you know, that is massively now impacting on, well, obviously, the Prime Minister's pledge to to cut the waiting lists, that, and he himself admitted that. That has political implications. As yeah. We discuss politics and health on here. Uh, obviously, most importantly, it has implications for the public, your patients, right. my constituents, who are yeah. who are sometimes getting sicker. Who are yep. sometimes, you know, m- being miss- missing treatments that they need to have, including cancer patients. We can't, du- we can't duck that. Yeah, we can't, we can't deny that. And so the government yesterday, we record this on a Wednesday. The government yesterday announced this consultation on minimum service levels to hospital-based services. So yep. what this comes out of is a minimum service levels act of parliament, which we debated extensively and we voted on. Many times. We passed that as a parliament um, a couple months ago and the government are now consulting as to what those minimum service levels look like in the NHS. And it's that they put out yesterday. And, you know, obviously the Secretary of State has a, a duty to do that under the Act mm. of Parliament. And it would it, the reason it's news is because obviously we're in the middle of a major industrial strike today um that's why it's been big news overnight and i was talking about it on channel 4 news last night on t- tuesday night so you know that Just, that is you can't blame ministers in a way for wanting to keep our hospitals safe and that's what the legislation is about um you know i think it's great that the consultation is opening because i think there's going to be some really powerful conversations that come out to the consultation which may not be comfortable listening not least that one of the challenges from 
those doctors who are striking is that we haven't got minimum safe staffing levels on a day-to-day -day basis. So to actually set some minimum safe staffing levels would be a big step forward for the NHS and has been something that doctors have been calling for anyway. So I think there'll be a really interesting side part to this consultation. I'd love to see us having the same conversation in general practice. What's a safe number of patients for a doctor to be seeing, for a nurse to be seeing, outside of obviously dire emergencies where we all step up and do what has to be done. But it's, it's very tricky. Um, very different. And it's I mean, very, I, very controversial. It's going to be very controversial be. because if you if you think about um, Matthew Taylor, remember from NHS yeah. Cromford, who we had on the podcast a few, few months ago, yeah. you know, he said yesterday that he knew that this is leading to dangerous levels of staffing in hospitals well, and all the stuff we talked about with patient safety. Yeah, I, you know, it has to be right that we get into that place. Well, I was going to flag two things that I've picked up on today. The HSJ, the Health Services Journal, are reporting today that industrial action has triggered 22 critical incidents since the start of the year. So these are very serious situations where patients have come to harm, either having to be transferred from one hospital to another, you know, things of that nature uh, that have to be reported centrally. And Roy Lilly's blog, some people, the Roy Lilly's Marmite in terms of what people think about what he writes, but he's he stated quite a clear fact today that the ONS data has shown that excess deaths in England tripled in the weeks surrounding the first unit of the strikes in March. Obviously, it takes so many months for that data to be uh, established I mean that's also worrying and I think everyone's examining um this situation I mean the certainly the media are starting to report very aggressively and negatively against doctors and that backlash is going to hurt as well it's it's this is we are we are now in a no-win situation for any side everyone's looking bad um I'll reiterate my please everyone get that get discussion and this is going to take compromise on all sides so the political point that I just make in closing on this is that the number one ask of the BMA was the pension changes. The government made the pension changes in the budget. The other big, big ask was for there to be a long-term workforce plan. There is a long-term workforce plan. There has to be a pay uh, negotiation at some point, and there has been. And I think the government are not for turning on this pay issue. They have said that that was the final offer. So some junior doctors getting a 10% rise, consultants a 6% rise. The inflation figures today have inflation just over 6%. So it is an inflation rise. I, I appreciate that it's not an above inflation rise, but taken together with the pension changes for, you know, what are some of the best paid people in society? Yeah. I don't think the government are going to move on pay. But the door, I, I'm talking to ministers, the door is well and truly open for all those other conversations about, you know, many, many other things, which we know doctors and have, a, have an issue with parking, yeah. food in hospitals, to quality of life in the workplace. We're very clear, both of us, that we don't bat for one side or the other when we do this podcast. But it, as you've sort of put the government position to it, I mean, the doctor's position is very much that the, what they're wanting is the chronic challenges of the long-term underfunding of the system to be put right because they feel there is chronic harm happening to patients uh, as well as healthcare professionals um, as opposed to the short-term harm that this happening through taking strike action now every individual doctor examines their own conscience when they decide whether to cross the picket line or not um, and you know percentages of doctors actually taking strike action are relatively modest although it varies interestingly by speciality to speciality so there's a lot in this Steve but I mean I, what I do know is that we're all being harmed we're all saddened by the whole state of affairs and um, I would really love it if in a few podcast episodes time we can say it's over well do you know what do you remember when it seemed hopeless with the nurses and the agenda yeah. for change and it seemed like there was no hope and there was no way through mm. and one was found and yeah. eventually one will be found. I remember being at DH with Jeremy in the middle of the first junior doctor strike. Uh, it seemed yeah. pretty bleak. But yeah. you know what? We found a way. And we, 2016, we will find a way. Okay, um, let's take a break and then we'll introduce our guest. Welcome back. You're listening to Prevention is the New Cure, the podcast with myself, Steve Bryan, and my good friend, Dr. Helen Stokes Lampard. Now, did I mention, Helen, that once upon a time I was a health minister? Oh, just a few times, Steve. Yeah. Just a few times. Well, I work with some pretty amazing people, as you can imagine, and the civil service totally wrongly maligned by certain former prime ministers this week um, are brilliant. And I had some great yeah. officials who were with me in the department and in different arm's length bodies, including Public Health England, which obviously was the, the forerunner of part of which became the UK Health Security Agency. One of those people is our guest today and um, is Professor Kevin Fenton. Hello, Kevin. 
Hi, really good to be here, Steve. And hi, hi Kevin. Helen. Lovely Hello. to see you again. Likewise. So, Kevin, um, who's wearing a headset, by the way, because this is an audio recorder. He's wearing a headset that looks like he's working for National Air Traffic Control. Steve, so you're, I, just, you're just jealous, Steve. You've I asked him earlier if he could tell us when the when when BA386 is landing at Luton. But anyway, one day we'll do the podcast in vision and then people can see these things. So the reason we got you on, Kevin, is that you are president of the Faculty of Public Health and you're regional director for London in something called the Office for health improvement and disparities within the department. But you're also the chief advisor to the government and chair of the HIV action plan steering group to sort of oversee the delivery of the new HIV strategy for England. And so we're going to talk to you about, about primarily that. And just, just tell us a little bit about your, your work in this, this office for health improvement and disparities. I talked about public health England, but this is one of the offshoots from that, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So uh, as you remember that uh, Public Health England was stood down uh, in the course of the pandemic and from Public Health England, we have uh, different public health agencies which have been created, including the UK Health Security Agency, OHID, that I work with in the Department of Health, and a number of our public health colleagues went into the NHS. So our work in the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities is really about promoting health, uh, tackling health inequalities, working across government on the prevention agenda, and supporting the delivery of prevention programs through the NHS as well as local governments. So really an important function for public health in England. So Kevin... I can't just how did you get into the HIV space? Because I think this, you know, obviously we've all we were all around about I'm not gonna I think you're younger than a teenager in the nineteen eighties when HIV burst onto the scene. How, how did your medical professional interest go down this route? Well, yeah, you know, a great question. You know, um I first went into medical school in 1985 uh, and at that time they were at the beginning of the HIV pandemic and at that time you remember we had no effective treatment lots of death lots of stigma uh, uh, and a lot of fear at that time and I remember thinking I want to be, be part of helping to address this pandemic and even though I went through medical school enjoyed my clinical training I knew I wanted to do public health so my first specialization in public health practice was as an infectious disease epidemiologist, um, a study of epidemics and how do you control them. And I actually specialized in HIV and sexually transmitted infections. And I did that for the first two decades of my career, worked here in the UK and in the US and have come back to the UK. And it's been a real privilege to be asked to oversee the HIV action plan. And you know what, Kevin, everybody enjoys working with you because, you know, I, I was bigging you up there in the introduction, but you are somebody who exudes uh, excitement and energy. And and that is great. And, you know, this podcast, which, you know, has just gone places we never expected it to go, is all about prevention. You know, the clue is in the name. And when I was doing the public health job and we first met and, you know, when, when I commissioned something called the HIV Commission, which was to look at how we would end HIV transmissions in England by 2030. And we've got an 80% reduction goal by 2025. And uh, Damien Gabil chaired the commission and I sat on it after I subsequently left government, as did the now Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. And we produced our report. And tell us about the HIV commission and how you now take forward those recommendations. So one of the things we've learned in effective tackling of the HIV epidemic over the past four decades is that there is power in bringing different constituencies together to create a shared mission in reducing HIV transmission, tackling stigma, preventing deaths, and really mobilizing the public, community, and policymakers towards that goal. And that's exactly what the commission did, because it was at a time when collectively in England, we needed to articulate a new vision for what we wanted to do with ending this this pandemic and ending HIV transmission. The commission's work was inclusive. As you remember, Steve, it involved deep community engagement, lots of political engagement, but also speaking to the public about our visions for ending HIV. And arising from that and the recommendations from the commission, the Department of Health worked with partners to develop the HIV action plan, and the action plan was launched in December of 2021. So we've been working on the action plan now for over 
uh, a year and a half. We're coming up to the second anniversary uh, from its launch. And that now is the roadmap and the template that will get us to ending HIV, hopefully within our lifetimes, because we're pushing to, as you say, significantly reduce HIV transmission by 2030 to end HIV stigma and absolutely to end HIV deaths by 2030. Bold ambition only being done here in the United Kingdom and really setting, I think, uh, the sort of pace for the elimination journey for HIV globally. So Kevin, as a frontline GP, obviously I've got quite a lot of patients with HIV dotted amongst uh, my population. And it, it can really feel the shift there in terms of their attitude, their sense of being prepared to talk more openly. At. I mean, I remember, in, you know, well, I started in my practice 21 years ago and, you know, there were sort of special codes and alerts and it was all very sort of hush hush about patients with HIV. And now that well, HIV, like they've had a stroke or they've, you know, got any other sort of chronic condition that we ma- we manage. And whilst what's interesting, of course, is that their medication is still provided centrally by specialist clinics, and there's still far less normalisation of their medication, which would, you know, I would, I'm expecting the shift to shared care agreements with GPs as a logical point of something in the future. But anyway, we can perhaps pick up on that. But I certainly feel that reduction of the stigma massively and normalisation of testing. How much of this is a consequence of what's happened centrally and how much has there been a push to the primary care side of it? I think it's it's everybody pushing together on that shared mission, right? Yeah. Um, and so as we become more successful at getting people on treatment, we have some of the highest treatment rates yeah. and the highest viral suppression rates of HIV anywhere in the world. Fantastic. So as we've become more adept at managing and controlling HIV, I think, you know, success builds upon success. Mm. And now people are beginning to see the massive reductions that we have been observing in HIV cases, especially in men who have sex with men, mm. um, which really, really began to turn the corner um, over the last five to seven years. And as we've been seeing those reductions, is really giving us a sense of the, what is possible by combining good treatment, scaling up HIV testing, doing the work on stigma, and of course, getting people on PrEP. So those are the four pillars of what we need to do to get to zero by 2030. And that's what we're focused on. In the so HIV I'm glad you just uh, mentioned PEP, PrEP, Kevin. Tell us, tell the listeners who don't mean maybe don't know, um, what is PrEP? And what do we need to do to get the PrEP roadmap where it needs to be? So PrEP is a medication which is given to individuals who may be at high risk of acquiring HIV. And it is effective, more than 98% effective in reducing the risk of acquiring HIV. In other words, it protects the person who's taking the medication from getting HIV if they're exposed to the virus. It's one of the most effective tools we have in preventing the spread of HIV because it protects HIV negative people from becoming, um, from acquiring HIV. And the challenge that we have is that it works so well that it's been really responsible for helping to reduce incidence in gay and bisexual men. Now we need to ensure that we get PrEP into the hands of other groups that might be at risk of acquiring HIV. For example, um, some of our uh, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups, especially heterosexuals, who may be at risk of acquiring HIV, and of course, people in other risk categories as well. So for gay men, we know we're winning that battle of getting PrEP uh, awareness and use. We now need to do more to get PrEP into the hands of other groups as well. And that's going to be a key focus of, for us with the action plan. And opt-out testing. You mentioned mm-hmm. that, right? So that was a key recommendation that the commission made. I remember being at a dinner that you were at in the house early this year, might even have been last, and there was a young man there who had, uh, he came off his bike in central London and he'd gone to an AED department. And because that A&E department practiced opt-out testing, so they would test you for HIV unless you opt out of it, um, it picked up that he, unbeknown to himself, had HIV. And yep. he was then able to go on, on the can't pass it on drugs to give him their colloquial title. And, um, you know, it didn't, su- has not suffering some of the uh, horrendous health impacts that you can get from undiagnosed, untreated HIV. So opt out testing, is it working and is there enough of it? 
Yeah. So, you know, again, one of the key pillars, Steve, of ending HIV is testing, because if you know your status, then you're able to get treatment earlier and therefore you're able to live a long and healthy life with HIV being managed um, uh, with effective HIV drugs. So testing is critical. Now, what opt-out HIV testing does is that it allows people who are coming into participating accident and emergency departments to be informed that in those that department, um, unless they decline to be tested, if their blood is taken, it will be tested for HIV as part of trying to identify and find HIV infections. In all of the hospitals that we're operating in, uh, all patients who are coming in are informed that this hospital is participating. Um, the tests are done. Uh, people who are found to be HIV uh, positive are then contacted by the health service and linked to effective HIV care. And in many instances, we are also partnering with community organizations to provide that sort of social support that newly diagnosed people can benefit from as well. It is a phenomenal intervention. It's being done here in the UK and very few countries around the world. In the first year of the program, Steve, we tested almost as many people People through the Optoid HIV testing program as we did the year before, only testing in GUM or genital urinary medicine clinics. Wow. So we've nearly doubled our testing capacity in so, England as a result of this program. Quick question of clarity, Kevin. How many hospitals are taking part in this yet and how far have we got to go? So we're testing only in the very high prevalence areas. Okay. And that means all of Inner the cities. emergency departments in London and yeah. some of the other big cities, including Manchester and including Brighton. Uh, and Blackpool, and isn't it? And Blackpool. What yeah, about Birmingham? Birmingham is up and running now, okay. I believe. Good. And we're working with Birmingham as well. So, this so you're is gradually a- rolling out gradually ruling it out. The next phase is to go mm. to the high prevalence areas, which will involve more towns yeah. and, and to be able to get more people tested. A very powerful tool. So the logical thing from this then for me, Kevin, is so you, you've, you've brilliantly thought about the, the, the surround support that people need, which is great and really important. But presumably then people who are picked up are also offered wraparound GUM support and wider testing for full STD screening. Is that right? That's right. So everybody who's newly diagnosed with HIV will be linked towards a full sexual health screen, getting the counselling and the support that they need. And of course, the encouragement about and the education, because one of the challenges that we have now, Helen, is we've got so good at diagnosing people and getting them into care, Mm. we need to keep them in care. And we know that about 10, 5 to 10%, depending on where you are in the country, of diagnosed HIV, uh, people living with HIV, may be falling out of care okay. at this stage. So that's why we need to have those wraparound services to help. So uh, for me, I mean, one of the big benefits of the pandemic for me was how our gender urinary medicine or sexual health services moved online brilliantly how we embrace the technology and i kind of think it's important for people to know how easy it is nowadays to get testing kits at home i mean the nhs has got this fantastic little website which is um to search for your local sexual health clinic you just pop in your postcode or your local town and these kits can be delivered very discreetly to your house and the number of times when i say this to our patients it's one of our standard sms responses to our patients in the surgery is you know, by the way, did you know we've got a fantastic service nearby? And it, it really has improved uptake. And I think for, uh, for a lot of younger people, for a lot of people who are older in new relationships who are excruciatingly embarrassed to think about sexual health screening, suddenly making it easy, normal and, and helping get over that is so important. It really is. The barriers that we had to HIV testing, remember back in the 90s when before mm. any HIV test, we had to do almost a half an hour of pre-test counselling. Yeah, it's I remember. A very, yeah, it's a very different environment that we're in now. We're normalizing HIV testing, whether you get it in the pharmacy, whether you get it in opto testing in emergency departments or in a GUM clinic. It is so important that we all know our status and we're empowered to make better choices about how we take care of ourselves and how we prevent passing HIV on to anybody else. And finally, remember, treatment itself is prevention, right? Because if you are living with HIV and on treatment, you have 0% chance of passing the virus on to anyone else. And that is one of the biggest breakthroughs that we've had in the last five years, the knowledge and confidence that once you're treated, 
once you're undetectable, you can't pass it on to anybody else. That's one of the best news in this pandemic that I've had working on this now for more than three decades. Yeah. Uh, Kev, one of the things that I found really interesting in, in doing work in this space, because you know what? I was a you know, I was a kid who grew up in a in a rural town in Hampshire, and I was at secondary school from 1985 to 1990. So all I knew of AIDS was the advert, the leaflet, and the voice. Mm-hmm. don't die of ignorance that's all i knew and uh wh- why would i you know as, as, as a straight guy living in rural hampshire why would it have ever crossed my path and it wasn't really until i got to parliament that i that i understood about the stigma and understood about you know and, and, and watching things like it's a sin on channel four which is just the most incredible piece of work and incredibly moving and the stat that i that really struck me was the number of infections of new infections of HIV in the heterosexual community now outstrip those in the in the gay and lesbian community. That is astonishing. And why opt out testing being in more places than just high prevalence areas is surely important. It's as important in Winchester as we go forward, maybe not today, but it'll be as important in Winchester as it is anywhere else if we're going to get to the the HIV Commission's aim of no new infections by 2030. Is that, fa- is that fair or is that too simplistic? No, it's absolutely fair that as we get towards elimination of HIV transmission, as we begin on this final journey of getting our numbers down, it is clear that HIV is going to be appearing in a number of different groups, right? It will appear in people who have poor access to healthcare services, so they get diagnosed late, for example. They'll be seeing HIV in people who have high levels of the sort of risk behaviors where they're injecting drug or are having unprotected sex, etc. And it will be more and more in people who are disconnected from services. And that, Steve, is why as we approach this final phase of the pandemic, our work gets harder, where we need to sustain the funding for HIV prevention, and we need to do that engagement with communities who may feel that they're not ex- at risk. And that's precisely why we need to do that engagement. And so, you know, this journey uh, it ha- hasn't been done before. Uh, the UK and England are leading globally on this, but it does take hearts and minds. And we have to deal with the stigma because as we get towards elimination and less people are seeing HIV, there's going to be more ignorance. So we need to keep those messages about HIV being important among all groups as part of this journey. Kevin, you're an absolute star. I I love the way you articulate this. Before we wrap up, I know time is tight. Can I just raise the fact that it is back to university time. It is freshest yeah. time everywhere. I'm a professor at the University of Birmingham. The campus is just buzzing with excited new young people meeting each other for the first time, getting to be their true selves. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, that often leads to quite a lot of close encounters. Um, and so I'm quite stuck. The BBC did a really good piece about, you know, you know, if you're having sex in freshers, use a condom. I mean, clearly we would say if you're having sex at any time that you're not it, <laughs> use a condom. Um, gonorrhea is really on the app, isn't it? It is. You know, we are, have been seeing real increases in the bacterial STIs, gonorrhea and syphilis, uh, over the past year. I'm very concerned about the rise in STIs. Now, it reflects a variety of things, right? Changing uh, sexual behavioral risk, people perhaps not using condoms as consistently as they did in the past. And of course, as things normalize post-pandemic, we're yeah. beginning to see people returning to different and perhaps the usual patterns of behavior. So I'm so pleased that the BBC is doing this. Yeah. Um, it never hurts to educate, especially young people, about STIs, about reproductive health and how to take care of themselves and this is exactly the sort of messages we want to be giving at this time condoms are so freely available from sexual health services from gp surgeries from online sources you know? yeah and of course uh, since we've been speaking about hiv v ensuring that you also know your hiv te- status as well you know yeah. over the counter testing go to your sexual health clinic many clinics are offering digital testing services now there's really no reason why you can't get access to test just to ensure that you don't have hiv and if you're sexually active that you're testing regularly to make sure any stis are diagnosed early my last word as a GP before I let Steve wrap us up. Um, sex doesn't just happen in young people. There's an awful lot of older people get into new relationships. And I've had plenty of slightly awkward conversations with people in their 60s who suddenly do the, oh, doctor, you know, please, 
you know, yeah. it, if it applies to an 18 year old, it applies to a 65 year old. If you're having sex, be careful. Yeah, and wrap it up literally um, <laughs> Kevin brilliant thank you for all you're doing and god bless good thank take you care. Time, guys. take care thanks Kevin welcome back hey wasn't Kevin great Helen he's fantastic he's always so energetic I love it I mean in in the words of Taylor Swift this is exhausting he is just <laughs> exhaustingly brilliant and as an official you know to work with in health policy he mm. was great fun because you know he's always coming up with new ideas and just driving it through with his enthusiasm yeah but he's, he's really he's, making it's a difference inte- it's intelligent enthusiasm and that's the best sort isn't it just isn't it just yeah yeah it's really good anyway well we're all fans of kev um right helen it's time for this the so first up this week migraines Ah, One of my government colleagues, Dehenna Davison, who Mm. is a lovely, lovely colleague, has resigned this week as a minister in the Department for Leveling Up and Local Government, Michael Gove's department, saying that her ongoing migraines are just making it impossible for her to do the job as a government minister. And, oh, my goodness, she's a lovely person and we wish her all the best. She's leaving Parliament, actually, the next election anyway, but we wish her all the best with that. Um, What did you spot about migraines this week, Helen? Yeah, I, they, so I mean, like obviously, there's the there's the sad news about Dehenna, but there's a new drug appeared on the scene. So, you know, nice, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence have supported a treatment or recommended use of a treatment. Now, you're the one usually asking for pronunciation advice, but for me, this is a new one. So, I think it said Remegapent or Remegapent. Um, which is going to be like a third line uh, treatment for migraine. So after the usual first line stuff, then the trip down treatment, it's given in a a form of a wafer, which dissolves under the tongue. And it seems to work in a novel way, differently from anything else we've had from migraine treatment, um, particularly focusing on the pain of migraine attacks, because migraines get loads of symptoms, but this one is really focused on the pain. And it was interesting that it was the pain, I think, that the henna complained of as being the challenge for her so mm. i mean fingers crossed for somebody like her this could be a lifeline and and can how do you prevent migraine i mean is the greatest cause having it in your family history or you know can you can something happen that then brings on migraine what what is the risk factors there are so there are loads of risk factors and i should have done my homework on this but from my gp perspective there are there are a whole heap of lifestyle things so some people so if you so yeah you start off with a tendency to migraine we believe that anybody can get a migraine it can be provoked in people right but you have a sort of genetic uh, inherent risk you have familial risk but then Other things seem to really affect some people. So for some people, there are dietary triggers like chocolate or alcohol or some other weird and wonderful things. I mean, I had patients swear blind to me that um, eating certain foods, um, spicy foods can set them off. And I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but they feel that for them, it's their lived reality. So it is what it is. And so for that, obviously, so there's dietary avoidance of known factors. Um, But then there are other people. So a lot of women notice they get menstrual migraine. So they have cyclical migraine related to the menstrual cycle. Okay. And so ironically, while some types of migraine, uh, you need to avoid the use of hormones and contraceptives for other types of migraine. Sometimes that's exactly what can help you by smoothing out the hormones. Um, and some women get migraine more around the time of menopause. And so again, there's, there's lots of stuff there, but I mean, many people, we just never find a cause. I mean, stress clearly can affect some people, but there are lots of preventative things that can happen, obviously looking after yourself and your well-being, but there are a whole range of drugs as well. NHS.UK has a really good site and there are lots of really good charities in this space. Mm. Okay, question from a, a, a Portsmouth a lady called Michelle. Um, why can't we get a COVID jab? And this is because oh, yeah. of the story that's running around at the moment. People 65 and over in England are being urged to get a top-up booster vaccine against covid at a time when more and more people are coming into hospitals with the virus, you can book it via the NHS website or the app, or you can call 119. Uh, and that the rollout's been brought forward because of this new variant called BA, that sounds like Kevin and his planes, <laughs> new, new variant called BA286. Yeah. What's the story here? So first of all, I'm going to shamelessly put a call out to my fantastic colleagues at the Westgate practice in Litchfield, where last Saturday we, between us, vaccinated 1,531 people for flu and the vast majority of those, well over 1,400 of them, got a vaccine against COVID-19 as well. So 
Just just team, massive team effort there. Um, and that's the start of many weekends we'll spend vaccinating this season. Um, so the season, it's underway. The complaint and the concern is from people who are age 50 to 65 who are otherwise fit and well, who are not uh, this year being eligible for vaccination on the NHS as part of the programme. So the people who are behind the decision making um, have done a lot of due diligence in this space and they feel that it is those who are over 65 and those who have healthcare problems uh, who are most at risk and those who are the ones it's being offered to. Now, that could be reevaluated if we do get a bad problem with with an uptake of this new variant. But at the moment, that is the way it stands. Um, I'm certainly seeing lots of COVID in, in patients uh, appearing at the surgery because a lot of people who don't know whether they've got COVID or not because they've no longer got access to testing. And we're not collecting the data in the same way. We're, it's becoming influenza in the way that we deal with it. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. And of course, like, like, like influenza, any coronavirus um, yeah. can be very dangerous if you are vulnerable or have an underlying health condition. So please be careful out there. Um, the, oh, can the I other... just, one quick yeah. thing, Steve, pregnant women, pregnant women definitely should be vaccinated. You are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. Some of the early communications that were put out seem to be a little unclear, but if you're pregnant, you're regarded as having a, a suppressed immune system. So you are eligible for vaccination. It is safe. It is effective. Please go and get your jab or book in for it if you haven't been contacted already, because sometimes coding of women in early pregnancy doesn't go through to the NHS system terribly well. So reach out to your uh, uh, 119 or your GP surgery if you haven't already booked in. Okay. Um, This is James Norfolk. Um, When are we going to ban disposable vape? Ah, vapes again. <laughs> no, yeah, for? it keeps coming up right. So I suspect this was driven by the news last week that the government have sort of shown a bit of leg in that they have said they want to ban disposable vapes. All sounds great, right? I have teenage children or one teenage, one almost teenage um children and as a parent of course i am worried about children vaping and flavors of vapes all the stuff we discussed before it sounds great just ban them the point here's the point right children shouldn't be vaping because it's illegal for them to buy them so if they're getting them they're getting them illegally now i know you know the, the the older the older kid buys a pack of cigarettes in in the in the olden days and gives them to the to the younger kid and i'm sure that's what goes on with vapes and at five quid a pop they're very cheap but we need to be very careful in this space helen because if we just ban disposable vapes then the adult smokers who are perfectly entitled to legally buy disposable vapes who who don't have a lot of money because non-disposable vapes cost a fortune and can do uh, they won't they won't move off the tobacco there's lots of evidence that they enjoy the flavors and they are part of the motivation to get them off the fags and to keep them on the vape. And we want people to come off cigarettes. It's still the biggest preventable killer in this country today. And we've got a smoke free ambition in this country that I set when I was in government that we are not anywhere near reaching right now. So my message on when will we ban disposable vapes is we need to enforce the fact that they shouldn't be sold to children because there's all sorts of massive impacts that are happening in schools, disruption to education, et cetera, et cetera. But let's be wary of the unintended consequences of doing that. Does that make sense? Totally. And I mean, this is what we t- discussed with Deborah Arnott from Ash, um, you know, and some of the challenges from the Royal College. Yes, of, we did, didn't we? Yeah. This, yeah. And there, there are so many good arguments either way on this one. So it's important to get it right. But I would hope there'll be a proper consultation, which will get us to the right answer. Um, I, you know, you know, I can't stand the smells and all the rest of it associated with the vapes, let alone all the harm that's happening. But I think getting away from that, you're right. We we don't want to throw babies out with bathwater. No, but the, the, we did a session on the select committee before summer recess, which was we fed that into the consultation on on these vapes, mm. and it's that that the government has sort of suggested that they might ban them. But we have yet to have any definitive statement from from them on this, so we will wait and see that with interest. Maybe we will ask the chancellor about this when he comes on the podcast, which oh. he will be coming on in the very near future. So I will leave leave us with that tease. You can find us. Uh, on social media prevention is the new cure you can email podcast at stevebryan.com and you can send in your pod surgery questions or suggestions for things you'd like to see us talk about 
Great to see you. Bye. Absolutely marvellous. See you next week. Bye. 